Namaskar, good evening to you all. Welcome to Desi Plaza TV. And this is the episode for Face to Face with Dr. Prakash Rao. Thank you so much for joining. And today we are going to present a very beautiful, interesting story about the person who actually gave all of his life, his expertise, and spreading the word about Hinduism. Being thousands of miles away from our heritage, culture, and tradition, and our roots, we always struggle to keep up with it, teach that one to our kids. When kids ask us how, what, when those questions, we really, really try to find those answers. And to give those answers today, we really do have a person who knows all about it, and also we are going to learn through his knowledge, expertise about Hinduism. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Prakash Rao Velagapudi, who is a very well-known personality in Dallas, Fort Worth area. He is not only a social worker, also he's a big contributor towards teachings of Hinduism. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash Rao. Thank you so much, and, and uh, I really appreciate your words. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, Today's word, like I said, we really do struggle. Yes. And uh, contributing these, this knowledge yeah. to us is not an easy thing. Correct. But before that, I would like to introduce you to our viewers. Okay. Please do tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, you see, I came actually to United States in 1965. I went to Michigan State, received my PhD, uh, master's degree, and then moved to Mississippi because there is a professor who was uh, doing a lot of research on India. So I wanted to do PhD actually in Mississippi. And uh, 67, I moved to Mississippi to study and uh, get my PhD. And uh, at that time, so I met my future wife. She also came from India in 1967. That is where we met. We both uh, received PhDs from the university. And then um, we spent um, almost 35, 36 years uh, teaching in different universities, mainly in Jackson, Mississippi. That is where uh, we, we settled before we moved to Frisco in 2009. Before the Mississippi, what brought you here to United States? You see, that was a, you know, it's a God's grace, I would say. You see, I mean, to tell you frankly, at least I cannot generalize anybody. I grew up in a very small village. I did not have much knowledge about anything. We are talking about 1965. And uh, so, uh, I was not sure, so, whether there are some countries where they will support your education and all that. So, after I received my master's degree in Andhra Pradesh, so I went to actually to New Delhi. I was working with one gentleman, Koneru uh, Radha Krishnamurti, because he also followed uh, Kakan Venkatratnam, who is from our village. So he asked that gentleman to take me to Delhi and then find a job. So I worked for him for about one and a half years. Then he suggested, no, 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 you cannot be, stay here in India. If you really want to know something about sociology and whatever you are interested, you have to go to go to uh, United States. So I didn't even know how to even apply for it or anything. So he himself called his professor because he received a PhD at Michigan State University. So he called his professor, got the application and asked me to fill it up. I didn't even know how to do it because there are some questions like, are you a veteran? is the question. I didn't know a thing about what that means. So I didn't fill it up. Then he himself filled it up. He sent it to professor. He got an assistant for me. That is how I, I was uh, basically um, divine force actually brought me here. Not because I really wanted to learn something, not that I wanted to come to this country, but there are certain things beyond our control. And also, in anybody, in everybody's life, there are some people who influence your future, Absolutely. who direct you just with one word or one act, your whole life changes. 
I always remember gentle gentleman because he is the one who prompted me, encouraged me, and pushed me to come to this country. That is how I came to this country, sure. and then started uh, um, our, journey. our journey. You also are a founder of a temple in Mississippi, and when we were talking earlier, correct, um, that we mentioned mm -hmm. someone very important asked yeah. you a very critical question correct, that every correct, parent correct, get, correct, like. Correct. When can we go visit a church? Correct. Because correct. they hear from all the friends. Correct. So, correct. what was your answer? You see, uh, of course, like most uh, Hindus, uh, I would say, dare to say, 90-95 percent of us mm -hmm. don't have a clue about our religion. We <laughs> cannot even speak one word about it. Mm -hmm. We have not read one book about our Hinduism. Mm -hmm. There was there was no formal transmission of knowledge in India mm -hmm. to any of us. So as a result, so we just come here almost like robots. We don't know anything about it. We know we are Hindus, except that one that we, we don't know anything about it. Sure. And uh, so then you get married and you have children. And uh, the children, obviously, they go to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, our children went to private school. And uh, so my son was about seven, eight years of age. And uh, one day he comes and says, um, Daddy, when are we going to church? So that really blew me off. <laughs> I, I was shocked actually, first of all. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to even respond to that one. Mm -hmm. I was stunned mm -hmm. and uh, I was thinking about it. And my wife and I discussed it to some extent, what is it that we can do? Mm -hmm. And um, so within a week or 10 days, we decided that we have to teach something about our religion uh, to our children. But, you know, as I mentioned, we didn't know anything about religion. The only thing that I could think of at that time was Raja is Ramayana and Mahabharata. Those are the only two books that I know. So then we said, okay, let's go ahead and start Sunday school. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we got that word Sunday school, but somehow we got it. So we had about 10 students every week come. And then the only thing that I was doing is basically narrating the story of either Ramayana or Mahabharata. And then at that time, so I had a few books also collected based on that one. So I prepared the courses every week, this one. And uh, over a period of time, the realization has come that we need to have some kind of a association with other Indians and see what is it that we can do as Hindus in order to promote and transmit the knowledge to our next generation. So, of course, there was an India Association already established. Mm -hmm. In India Association, so we thought we will have some kind of a committee, which we called building committee, mm -hmm. and see if we can have a building where we can build and then start teaching all wow. these classes. Okay. Also, celebrate our festivals, because we used to go to some church and other organizations and do Diwali and um, the Navaratri, all those items. Then slowly it moved and then so we started the uh, uh, Hindu Temple Society of Mississippi. That was around 82, 83. Mm -hmm. And till that time, so we went to actually Pittsburgh. <laughs> By that time there was a Balaji <laughs> Temple. Right. Every year we used to go as a pilgrimage actually, every summer. That was uh, at least about 10 years we went there. Mm -hmm. And then around 83, 84, we started the temple in, ja in Jackson, Mississippi itself. Mm -hmm. So at that time, we had probably 125, 130 families. That's all we wow. had in Jackson, Mississippi at that time. <coughs> we are talking about 82, 83. Mm -hmm. So then we assembled and then we discussed and did what is it we can do? Mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, shall we have a community hall or a temple? In the beginning, everybody felt that, you know, we need to have a community hall because there are other groups of people also. But within a year or so, we realized that there may be a conflict of interest in this one if we build only Hindu temple, but not address the issues of other religions. So as a result, one of the lawyers advised us, either you build Hindu temple or you build India, India, so India building. So don't have, don't mix it these two. Then we separated ourselves into Hindu Temple Society of Mississippi mm -hmm. and then we registered and uh, then we built uh, about um, 10,000 square feet uh, hall and uh, then within um, a year or so, 
we were able to complete that building and then at that time since we have only 100 120 families mm -hmm. so we need some support from everybody <laughs> in order to get support what is it we have to do whoever suggests any god we we just included in the in the temple you so we had 17 17 murtis in our temple in wow. jackson mississippi okay. so we never realized how difficult it is to manage with 17 no, murtis. We didn't know how many priests we needed at that time. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what is the difference between we are Vaishnavites and Shaivites and all that one. We just wanted to have a temple. That's all the ultimate goal. We didn't, none of us had any knowledge about how to manage it, how to operate it, what are the customs, what are the traditions, how many times you have to do. All those things we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So we evolved over a period of time mm -hmm. and then so we put all those 17 murtis actually in the temple mm -hmm. and uh, then it was a big hall mm -hmm. and uh, on one side in one side so we have all these murtis mm -hmm. and then there is a big hall so that is how we started at the journey later on people have realized that it is not really serving the purpose and also it is not according to the sastras or the scriptures mm -hmm. because this one is like a community hall with with murtis rather than a temple with murtis okay let me interrupt you in uh, yes. right here when yeah. you said community hall so we do i mean we are used to going to temples in india with the gopuras and all those uh, you know artis and it has a very unique Correct. atmosphere, ambience Correct. in that temple. Correct. So how, what do you say, how important it is to have that ambience in the temple? You see, it is very, very scientific. Um, you see, the temple, according to all these scriptures and all these astras, you have to have a temple with all the gopuras and inside or in outside, it doesn't matter where it is, you have to have it for a number of reasons. Okay. One. You see, there is always, the, in the Gopurams, when you just look at the mm -hmm. uh, Kalashas, Kalashas receive the vibrations from the sun and, uh, and all the planets. Okay. And those vibrations are passed down to the deities that are installed in the Garbhagudi. Okay. Also, the temple is always compared with the human body there is no difference between a temple and a human body okay. all the parts whatever parts that we see today in the human body they are also replicated in the temple so if you look at it rajagopuram mm -hmm. is like a feet okay. so generally when you when you have that traditional temple uh -huh. so when you enter through rajagopuram okay. that means you touch the mm -hmm. rajagopuram that right. means you are touching the feet feet and then you come to the Dvajastamam. Sure. Dvajastamam is like a, um, a, you know, recreation, creative type thing. And then you will also see next to it Dvajastamam mm -hmm. and uh, Balipitam. So these are like male and female combinations actually. Okay. You know, Dvajastamam and then Balipitam. And then you come into the temple that is like a our our um, our chest and uh, our stomach kind of thing. Okay. And then you go to Ardhamandapam, mm -hmm. that is like a throat kind of thing. Yeah. And then you go into the Garbhagudi, that is like our head. Okay. And then at the same time, if you see, most of the temples also have the side gopurams, east and west, west, north and south and all that. So, when usually all the temples face, mm -hmm. most of the, I would say, not all, 90-95 percent of the temples face only east. Okay. When they face east, that means west side, mm -hmm. there will be a gopuram mm -hmm. that is like a tuft mm -hmm. of a human person. Protection. And then north and south also you will have the gopurams. Okay. They are like left and right hands. So wow. if you look at the whole, you know, if you look at any human being laying down, right. so you have the head, you have the throat, you have the chest and the stomach, and then you have um, the knees and you have the feet. Uh, feet. Okay. All those things match exactly the way our people have done. Mm -hmm. 
So that means you need to have that kind of vibrations. Right. When you enter, mm -hmm. you automatically you are supposed to feel the vibrations. Vibration. At the same time, whenever a temple is mm -hmm. constructed based on science, mm -hmm. uh, based on our Agama Shastras and Shilpa Shastras, so you need to have the priests mm -hmm. who can actually chant daily mm -hmm. mantras in order to create more vibrations and uh, so that way if anybody who comes into the temple mm -hmm. they should feel those vibrations the more they do pujas okay. the more they chant more vibrations are created okay. so uh, that's the reason whenever we go to temple mm -hmm. you our pur our main purpose of going is to have some kind of a peace of mind okay. i mean that's all we go why do we want to go just to, because even though we may not realize it okay. you want to have some peace of mind reduce the stress after eight hours of um, whatever we do in this country what not uh, you, you want to release, release this this stress and uh, stress. stress so you go to that one you sit there for a few minutes you meditate a little bit or you listen to the chanting so those chanting the vibrations are enormous scientifically it is proven mm -hmm. these mantras have so many benefits mm -hmm. the, when they chant it will pierce through every pore of your body, wow. every part of our body. It touches your heart, it touches your brain, it influences your, your, uh, your brain. Mm -hmm. So that is the impact these mantras have. We don't realize it. If you look at the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, some people might say, well, you know, you can do puja at your home and whatnot. Yes, there is no question about it. But the, the, but, uh, the benefits that you receive by visiting temples are definitely better than, stay, than doing it at home. That's a wonderful uh, uh, knowledge about because a lot of us go to temple but we have absolutely no clue yeah. about all these things. And Correct. thank you so much for sharing uh, this one with us. And uh, uh, we will just continue this one with our next episode and uh, Dr. Prakashav is going to tell us the importance of, I'm going to ask him with the importance of a bell, maybe what it does to us and also much more. So stay tuned. <laughs>